Good morning, everyone. It is a pleasure to see you. I'm so excited and I'm here to welcome you to the Nonprofit Technology Summit on this fine Thursday. My name is Sia Magadan and I'm with Rooted Communications and you will get a chance to see all of us. But right now, as we are getting started, I'm going to invite you to please share in the chat your name, organization, and pronouns. Where are you coming from? Please include your net land acknowledgement if you know them. And if you don't, you can visit the link that will also be placed in the chat so that you can find out. We do this to honor the indigenous population and also to just be mindful that indeed we are on property that has been taken. And we do this also to continue to humanize our brothers because like the song says, this land is your land, this land is my land. You can also include what brings you here today. Why have you decided to join us? What you hope to gain? Also, any, access, any accessibility needs that you want to share. And if you have not completed the survey, please take your time and do it now. But again, we're going to give you a couple of moments. Share with us who's in the room, what land you are on, and what brings you here today. Also, please feel free to include any accessibility needs that you would like to share. Next up, let's talk Zoom etiquette. We're not strangers to this, but we just wanted to cover a couple of things. Please be aware of your camera angle, making sure that you're being seen and that nothing that you don't want us to see is in the view of the camera. Stay fully clothed, but no dry cleaning is necessary. Please use your name or organization, include your pronouns. And if you don't know how to do that, go over, if you hang the cursor over your picture, there's three dots in the corner. If you click on it, it says rename at the bottom. You can do that. And then if you wanna include your pronouns or your organization, you can do that, press enter, and then it shows up for us. Also, please remember to keep your mic on mute, just to uh, bear down on some of the background noise. <laughs> And just as an FYI, my little coworker is joining us today. So if you happen to hear the, the joyful sounds, he's here to my right. He's only two months. So we're trying to work on the whole cubicle share thing. So please bear with us. <laughs> Next slide. All right, so this is our agenda for this morning. So you have an idea of where we're headed and what will be taking place. Well, starting out with our welcome and community agreements, and then we're going to move on into the costume contest. Woo! Then we will talk about TechSoup and the digital transformation. Then we will move into solution rooms where they'll be broken down by either programs, fundraising, or communication. And each person will be allowed to share a situation, and then we'll all work together to come up with some possible solutions. Exciting. Then we're going to come back as a whole and share out with the larger group, thereby being able to provide somewhat of a teaching hospital so that everyone can gain some best practices and some new information. Then we're going to go on a break. Next, and then continuing on. After the break, we will do some technology topic deep dives with our wonderful volunteer facilitators. The event will close between 1245 and one, and then there'll be an opportunity to network and some private breakout rooms. So if you wanna hang out and stay around and chat and continue to just talk through some things, we welcome, we invite you to, but we also are mindful that people have other things going on. So please do what works for you. Next up, we have the community agreements, and I wanted to just share them with you, where we, our goal is to create a space of belonging. So first and foremost, approach with curiosity, be open to new ways of doing and thinking. Sit with discomfort, accept and accept non-closure. Engage and be present, practice mindful listening. Be aware of power dynamics. Consider the space you consume and be willing to share space. Yeah. Speak from your experience. Always assume best intent and acknowledge the impact of your words on others. Accept restraints as presented. Ideate, yes, and embrace being messy. For those of us who you know, are type A friends, put aside perfectionism and allow yourself the space to to learn, in a, to fail in a safe space. That's what we like to say. 
Vegas rules, Sesame Street rules. What's shared here stays here. What's learned here leaves here. Be willing to slow down, notice and name what is coming up in the room. Most importantly, take care of yourself and have fun. And if there's anything else that you feel like we should add to the community agreement, feel free to add it to the chat. And if you like any of the ones that you've seen, same rules apply, Sesame Street, feel free to use them within your organization or next meeting space. Now, with all of these things out of the way, I'm going to turn it over to Lily, who will be facilitating our costume contest. Thank you, Sita. So um, as you all probably know, we're all doing a lot of very serious hard work in what has been a very serious and hard time for humanity. But that doesn't mean that we can't bring a sense of fun to our work and our lives. And in fact, I believe that fun is needed now more than ever. So as you can see, I'm in costume, oh dear. And I hope that some of you are as well because we have a costume contest happening right now with real prizes. The first place winner will receive a $75 gift card for Etsy, then $50 for second place and $25 for third place. If you're not familiar with Etsy, it's a wonderful online marketplace to purchase items from makers in your town or from across the world. But what if you don't have a physical costume today? Well, you can still enter. Let's take a look at how to do that. So Zoom has virtual costumes available. Um, I truly recommend that everyone plays with these, even if you do not plan to enter the costume contest, please treat yourself to some fun. To access them, like you see in the screenshot, you'll click the up arrow to the right of your start or stop video, which is at the bottom of your Zoom screen. And depending on whether your video is on, depending on whether your video is on, and then you'll click the choose video filter button, which you can see highlighted in the screenshot. We'll give you a few seconds to do that and then we'll show you what to do next. All right, and we've looked away already. So I think it's time to hear about, hear some more about digital transformation. Hi, can everyone hear me now? Yes. Oh, wonderful. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Mona Reina, um, and I work for TechSoup, and I'm here to talk about digital transformation. Uh, I am utterly gutted that TechSoup removed video filters from my Zoom options, so I was not able to be in. I know, right? Cheryl, I mean, like, what? I want to complain. I know. This is, this is not the kind of digital transformation I'm looking for. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, um, so this is plain old me, unfortunately, um, but I'm really excited to um, talk to you actually third year in a row running uh, about digital transformation and uh, it's been wonderful to do it in, at the nonprofit summit and at Bad Camp uh, before because uh, we've had an opportunity to show our journey with our digital transformation solution um, in the summit. Um, so actually, if you go to the next um, slide, please. Oh, yeah, there's sort of, sorry, I realized this is in the wrong order. No <laughs> sorry, Mona. Um, okay, but I'm going to give this reminder again later as well. Um, hopefully you all ahead of time either did the pre-survey or just read some of the emails that came across. And the three pillars that we're going to focus on as Mona's going through our programs, fundraising and communications. So if you can take um, time while Mona's talking and hopefully before the end to rename yourself as a one, two or three so that I know the best way to group you. Um, that will be really helpful in terms of the kind of um, things you want to talk about are uh, the birds of a feather and some of the things that you would put into um, the jam board is for the second half of our um, meeting today or summit today. So this first part will be focused in these three areas. So if you can just put a one, two or three before your name, and if there's anyone from your team and where you're wanting to be in the same team, um, then just message me directly and then I'll try and get you into the same group. 
Um, otherwise, um, I'll also paste all of this into the chat in case um, it gets missed as Mona continues. So sorry, I should have had that before you started going. <laughs> but here you go, back to you. Um, no issues, and I actually have a, a slide, so I'm going to give everyone about 10 seconds to do that later on as well. All right, so I love this. Uh, I love this cartoon. I found it online, and I thought that was so representative because, um, you know, it what we speak about in terms of digital transformation has dramatically changed, and in many ways has unchanged since COVID. Um, so, uh, you know, I feel like with COVID, everyone became digital and everyone took on technology. And now after two years, uh, we hear everyone like coming to us and saying, hey, we've got like 10 technologies, but we still kind of are struggling how to get them to work together and how to get the technology to do what we want it to do. So it, it almost feels like they've taken on, you know, they've like reacted and taken on 10 times as much problems that they had before and they're like now how do we get everything to work because now we've got 10 different things trying to speak to each other so i thought this cartoon was a great representation of that where everyone is like oh you know i'm on zoom now i'm on slack i'm on this and i'm digitally transformed and actually that's so not true especially for the nonprofit sector um so next slide please So in the last, um, actually the reality is in the last four years, uh, since 2017, we've been struggling with understanding how to define digital transformation um, and what it means for a nonprofit. So it took us a while, but the way that we wanted to put out a definition and the definition we have is digital transformation is the process of determining and implementing policies increasing staff capacity and specific technology systems which allow organizations to deliver their services with greater impact for the individuals they serve, their own decision-making processes and policy decisions in their communities. Coming out with this definition was really important to us because we when we were doing this kind of discovery, we found that digital transformation was consistently being defined by the for-profit or by the tech community. And you know, we needed to expand on that definition for what it means for nonprofits. And the one thing that was very clear to us is what digital transformation has to anchor on for nonprofits is the impact, is self-determination, is community and collaboration. And in these in these places, they are, it is very dramatically different from a for-profit, where a for-profit would do digital transformation really for revenues. It's more about competition than collaboration. Hence, the way that a non, the nonprofit sector uses data. So when we say we need to collect data, measure our impact, we also want to collect data in a way in which we are collaborative, because that's what the sector stands for. Whereas for a for-profit, they would do it to be competitive. So, you know, it, 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 there are so many ways that we discovered um, it's they're so different. And we thought this definition was important because this also defines what are the solutions that we came up with for digital transformation. So if you go to the next slide, please. So, um, huh, okay, thanks. Uh, so what, uh, one of the biggest challenges um, for, I wanted to have this slide. This is the same slide that we've had for three years. Um, and all I did was add the challenges haven't gone away. So the challenges for the nonprofit sector for digital transformation, you know, it's, it's, it's the same lack of IT expertise, access to consultation, transition to, um, you know, SaaS solutions as a service, a software as a service, the overhead myth, lead gen tools. These still are the main issues that nonprofits, especially small nonprofits deal with. And with COVID, it's not like any of this has gone away. Sure, we've taken on tools, but we still don't have access to IT expertise. We're still struggling with moving from on-prem to the cloud. It's not magically improved lives. You know, we still have issues with access to good uh, verified consultants who we can afford within our budgets that can come and give us advice. So these solutions haven't gone away. They've 
they're still very much fundamental to why the nonprofit sector has, has, has stayed behind in terms of digital transformation. And these are the kind of challenges that we wanted to create solutions for. So if you go to the next slide, please. So in terms of a solution, so, you know, given that we now have a definition about digital transformation, uh, we've identified what are the main challenges that the nonprofit sector is dealing with. Uh, TechSoup launched uh, the Digital Transformation Initiative. We launched it about three years ago. Um, and over the last three years, we've been working on building solutions that can help small and micro nonprofits get digitally transformed. There are four aspects of that solution. The first is defining a digital um, transformation and assessment framework. So what we realized was a huge challenge is that every nonprofit is different, right? And that's, that's what is special about us. Um, it's the fact that every nonprofit is working against the odds and coming up with really innovative ways to deliver their mission. But what that has meant is that it's been very difficult for someone to come out with a framework and say, use this. You know, like here's what every nonprofit can use if you just wanted to um, think about how to start digital transformation or what are the areas you can think about for your transformation. Most of the nonprofits I spoke to, what's happened is that every consultant comes in and kind of has a different perspective. So you're really dependent on the advice or the expertise of the consultant, but there's no one map, right? Like a singular map. What is a framework that we can all use and look at and say, yeah, that makes sense. And, you know, I can score myself. So the first thing that we worked on was a digital assessment framework. And I'll go into that, into each of these parts later. Uh, the second one was a digital capability model. And this was the second thing that was really important because when we asked ourselves the question, what is digital transformation? The next question we asked ourselves was, how do we know we're transformed? What does, what does transformation even mean? So how can someone know what stage of capability they are? What are all the stages of capability? So, you know, this is the second thing we realized that after we built a framework, we all needed to know where are we on this journey and where, where are we as opposed to other people so that I know who I need to learn from, right? So that was the second thing we came up with, which was a digital capability model that helps us measure where we are in the digital transformation journey. Um, and then we came out with a digital assessment tool. And this is basically a on free online web tool that any nonprofit in the world can use. We've implemented the digital assessment framework in this tool. The tool automatically provides a score based on the digital capability model. And the tool provides recommendations based on the assessments that each nonprofit does um, so that you have access to resources to help you get to the next step or to help you fi fix what we see are gaps uh, in your organization. Um, so then really the fourth part that we worked on was this marketplace of resources. So we realized that we are helping nonprofits figure out what they need. We're telling them where they are. We're giving them a tool to kind of do this whole process uh, easily. And then we needed to bring resources so that nonprofits could easily access, um, you know, articles, courses, software, hardware. We needed to bring it all together because that's the other thing that we heard from all over TechSoup was we have a lot, but, you know, nonprofits have to struggle to find exactly what they need. So we wanted to connect the need with you know, with, with the solution and the resources. And one thing I do want to mention is that this marketplace of resources, even though we've just started with TechSoup, the intention is to bring the world of resources to nonprofits. We have not, um, you know, like it, this is not only about TechSoup, we're already working with NetHope and Tech Impact and many, many other organizations around the world so that we can bring make this a true global marketplace of resources for nonprofits for their digital transformation. 
I'll stop here because I feel like I've spoken a lot and I've thrown a lot your way. Um, so I'm just going to stop here for, for any questions. And, you know, it, even while I'm speaking, if you have any questions, you can use the raise hand um, emoji in your reactions. Okay, I don't see. There was class. one question that came in around SAS. And if anyone doesn't know what the SAS acronym is, it's software as a service. Yeah, so it's software as a service and it's really SAS is, is all of the cloud solutions where, um, you know, like Salesforce is, is a SaaS. It's software as a service where you can get access to Salesforce on the cloud. All right, um, next slide. Okay, so the framework. So like I mentioned, one of the first things we did was come up with a framework. And, you know, we said, like I said, our definition says that digital transformation for a nonprofit should really be grounded on their mission. And that's what this framework does. We wanted the framework to be really simple. So we decided that the frame, so the framework, if you see, has three sections, right? It's the why, it's the what, and it's the how. That's your digital transformation plan. Why do you want to do your digital transformation? Because you want to meet your org goals, your org mission, um, much more efficiently and effectively with higher impact. So the framework connects your mission and your goals directly to what do you want to do? Here are six focus areas that every nonprofit should have digital capability in. It took us a while and a couple of iterations, but these are the six that we've landed on after two years of research with global partners and institutions. These are the six that every nonprofit in the world we feel um, uh, that matches uh, what every nonprofit in the world needs digital capability in. So programs, fundraising, communications, operations, security, and infrastructure. There are two things in here that I think some of you might feel is missing. The one big word, data. Why isn't data in here when you know we've mentioned data in our definition? That's because we've actually, we found, we initially had a separate data section, but then we found that you know data is so integral and it has to become such a part of our behavior that we've included a data and measurement question in all six of these assessments. So the, our perspective is data is very much a big part of how we do everything. You should be looking at your communications data. You should be looking at your beneficiary data. You know, you should be looking at your program data, your security data. So there's no way to get around data. The second thing that's missing here um, that's been pointed out is change management. Because when we talk about digital transformation, it's very difficult to do all of this planning without change management. And We've not had it this in this framework because it's one of the resources that we recommend. Because we find that also change management is not something that is generic. Change management is a very, very unique process um, that is unique to every nonprofit. So the way that we deal with or with providing change management feedback is to have better change management resources for nonprofits. Um, so we're currently adding a lot around leadership management, you know, board management and all of that in our resources. So the framework is fairly simple. You know, it's um, what's your org mission? We ask organizations to think about their strategic goals. Now it's up to you how long you want to have those goals for. We recommend between one to three years. You don't want to put goals in there that are less than one year because then you're too reactive. You're thinking about the fires. You don't want to have it longer than three years because that, that's too much in the future. And any plan you make today would be frustrating because you're like, yeah, that's, that's what I want to do in the future, but it's not really solving my problem now. So what we have, you know, we recommend is think about your strategic goals for the next one to three years. And then based on those roles, pick your focus areas. The reason why we split it all up is because you can't do everything. 
right? That's the other side of the myth that we want to bust right now. Digital transformation doesn't mean that you got to go in and magically put all your, you know, put all your eggs in this basket and go and transform everything and it's done. Digital transformation is a journey. You should absolutely focus on what matters to your mission and your goals first. We want to help you figure out what those focus areas are. We want to help you figure out what your tactics should be. What are the activities that can help you get there? And then we want to help you figure out what do you do next, right? So what's the next stop in that journey? So if you go to the next slide, I've kind of created a small example of how a nonprofit might use this digital transformation framework. And we're actually currently doing courses um, through TechSoup, helping a cohort of nonprofits do exactly this. Um, so, you know, if you think about it, it's, it's very simple framework to use because we have start with your org mission, right? So I've used one of our, um, uh, I've actually just got this from the web, in fact. So the mission is we make great food for all people to support a better food system. We demonstrate fair business practices by providing a quality workplace and creating delicious, dignified food for our community. So when we worked, we said, okay, what are your strategic goals for the next one to three years? So they came up with two, uh, increase funds raised through online events by 20% by December, 2022. Um, and that was to help the org achieve its overarching goal of $1 million in funds by 2022. Strategic goal two was increase awareness of the organization mission to the broader community with increase of 30% in food orders by July, 2022. So once they gave us this, these uh, strategic goals, you know, basically it was through conversation with their teams and we were like, okay, now we force them to pick two focus areas, just two. You know, and what the team came back with was that uh, they thought that they want to focus on fundraising and communication. And we were like, great. And we went back and said, what is your area of risk? And they came back and they said, you know, a big area of risk is security because we're going to be doing a lot of online fundraising and we will be having a lot of information and credit cards and we're really worried about that. And we said, awesome. So now what we recommend through this framework and through this kind of planning process is let's just focus on these three, right? And you're always going to get pulled to do everything everywhere. You're always going to think I have to do more in programs, I have to do more in you know, my operations says, you've already picked this as your strategic goal. Let's now develop the tactics to meet this goal. Um, so if you go to the next slide. So when, you know, we've created worksheets, but really uh, an example is once you have this, um, you know, basically you can even think about creating almost like a mini plan, right? Where through this framework, as you go through this framework, they pick the goal of increasing their funds by 20% through online events. They pick their own focus areas. They said our focus areas are fundraising, communications, and security. Within those fund, within those focus areas, we said, okay, why don't you guys pick some topics? What are the topics you want to work on? And we have a we have a list of topics for each of these areas. So we have a list that you can actually go through and say that helps you think about what are the areas of fundraising you really care about. Right, and then think about what are the activities you have to do. So this is a way in which we can help the framework and help a small nonprofit to come up with a basic plan, right? And to think about, okay, this is what I wanna do together as a team. Now, this is just the framework. This is just how you start thinking about, it's just to help you think, right? It's just to help you figure out what are your areas of focus? What are the steps that you wanna take? What we have is the tool that actually, once you go into the tool, the tool does assessments for you. So once you pick these focus areas, you could actually go into the tool and say, okay, now I want to assess my fundraising because that's really what I want to improve. You can do a set of 20 questions and we, the tool would be able to give you recommendations based on how you responded to those questions. So you can easily take all of those recommendations and figure out based on this plan that you came up with, what are the recommendations and resources you wanna use that will help you with this plan, right? So an example would be redesigning the website. You wanna redesign your website. Once you do the assessment, the tool brings up recommendations of, hey, for website design, 
we have a Wix offer for nonprofits. That's a donation offer. We have, um, there are two consultants that we know work with nonprofits that can help you with your redesign. There is an offer to just do your website design. There are other offers to add to your website security. So there are offers to add apps for your fundraising button on your website. So, you know, these are, what happens is you have this overall plan, you use the tool and you get very tangible uh, things, right? And you can figure out from those tangible things, which are the ones that you can use. And, you know, they have a, they have a price against it. So you can start putting together what is possible for you for what you want to achieve with the budget you have. So um, if you go to the next slide, so this is kind of what I mentioned where, you know, we have these focus areas, but we've also provided kind of detailed subcategories within each focus area. So when you are thinking about your plan, um, you know, for example, the fundraising, you can, you can say, hey, do I want to do, uh, you know, do I want to do a fundraising event? And be like, yeah, okay, that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to do an online fundraising event. So I really should look at fundraising event management and assess myself on that. Um, what do I need to do a proper online fundraising uh, event? Um, do I want to look at donor management? Do I want to look at donor engagement? You may, you may not want to focus on all five of these from the get-go, right? Maybe in the first year, you're like, I'm only going to focus on fundraising event management. And then year two, I will look at, you know, my donor engagement and donor management. So these kind of subcategories are there to... Um, to help you figure out what parts of this kind of focus area do you want to uh, prioritize for your organization. Next slide. So everything that I just showed you is actually available in a goal setting worksheet. So what we've done is we put together a worksheet that takes you step by step through this digital transformation framework. Um, and it gets you to that table that I just showed you, which is what's your goal, right? What's your, which are the focus areas you pick out of these focus areas? What are these subcategories? And then what are the tactics you want to do? This worksheet will just, it just helps bring a team together to do a little planning, right? Because sometimes you just need a little help to, to put everything together. And what this worksheet does is once you do it, it also helps you understand what parts of the tool you want to use, right? Because you don't want to waste your time and you do everything and then you're like, oh gosh, now I have 800 resources. How, which of these do I want to use? So this helps you kind of focus. Um, all right, so next slide. So now that we've kind of spoken about the framework, and, um, you know, our target today in the Birds of a Feather and Solution Rooms is to discuss programs, fundraising, and communication. Um, if you haven't already done so, I want to give you an opportunity to figure out which solution room you would want to be part of uh, and change your, um, put the number in your name. So then uh, Val can add you to that particular solution room. Or if you want to be with a particular person in a room, then please message uh, Val and she will try and accommodate you. So I've been speaking for a while. I'm going to give everyone 20 seconds and I'm also going to look at the questions. So you have some time to update um, your number. Um, So uh, Catherine says, um, this is a helpful framework. Thank you. And thank you for bringing up change management. Thank you, Catherine. At some point, I'd love to hear about very specific strategies you have to support comms programs, fundraising staff in growing digital capacity and implementing a plan when there are team members who are resistant to change despite leadership encouraging it. Um, that's actually, that's, that's such a great question. Um, and you know, what we're doing right now, so you're right, there's like change management from a leadership perspective, because we often hear about IT staff who are, you know, who, are, who know the solution, who want to implement something, but then 
they have a hard time convincing their leadership or their boards uh, to implement it. I think change management on the other side is also absolutely right, where folks have done something a certain way always to get them to change uh, and to implement something new is very different. So uh, some of the ways in which we are helping with this is, um, you know, we're looking at change management from a leadership and convincing your board perspective through courses um, that help leadership in um, understanding why change is important and how to create these kind of strategies to convince your board. We're also looking at change management training from the staff level. So um, part of those trainings that we, are, we don't have it developed yet, but we're working with partners to develop that. Some of the strategies that we are looking to employ um, are you know how to move teams, like how to align teams on what you wanna achieve together um, to then kind of agree on the solution. So a lot of this has to do with the fact that everyone has to be signed up to why something is, is good, right? Like why it's important and how we all achieve that uh, goal together. So we're actually looking at developing resources, mainly training resources, webinars, articles, and blogs um, that could help with that. Um, and I would be really, um, I'd love to know if there are more kind of ideas, stories, and case studies for this that you have tried that have worked. Um, and I'm sure, uh, I mean, I'd love to know more. We'd love to implement that and find more solutions around that. And I agree with Val, I think it's a great question to bring up in the solution room as well. Um, membership management is also included in fundraising, yes. Um, okay, so I have five minutes and uh, if you can go to the next slide. Thank you. Um, so this is a really quick overview of the tool. Uh, so basically the digital assessment tool, the DAT, um, is, uh, was released by TechSoup uh, this September. So we're very proud of it. It took us two years to build it. Uh, the digital assessment tool can be used to be a companion in your digital transformation journey. What the tool does is it does three things. It helps you assess your needs. The tool is built against the TechSoup digital assessment framework. So it has those same six focus areas. So if you did your worksheet, and you would be like, I need to focus on fundraising. You could go into the tool and just do the fundraising assessment. The tool gives you a digital capability rating. So this is what I was saying about the score. So we have, we um, realized that every nonprofit, the stages of capability, digital capability are basically five. That nonprofits are ad hoc, functional, standardized, optimized, or adaptive. And what the tool does is based on the answers you give to the assessment, it tells you what your stage of capability is and it helps you understand why. And then the third thing it does is it gives you recommendations and resources and the resources and recommendations that we have so far are software, hardware, courses, services, webinars, blogs, access to consultants and policy that we're putting together. So it's fairly comprehensive. We've tried to think about all of the other different resources that a nonprofit might need. Um, but then these recommendations are set up to help you get to the next stage. So, and these recommendations are customized to the stage you're in. So for example, you know, if, if you responded in your assessment that you were a two person org, you know, and um, you needed to do more fundraising, we would not say the next software you should use is Salesforce because we know that Salesforce needs its own stuff and that would not be a helpful recommendation for you. So we have customized recommendations to your stage of capability. Um, and uh, yeah, and you know, the intention of the tool is really that you can use it as many times as you want. You can bring in as many of your, invite your teammates into the tool. So the idea is we know in a nonprofit not everyone knows everything, right? Typically you'd have one person that understands your fundraising system, another person that understands your security, another person that probably knows how your operation and collaboration framework works. So what the tool does is you get to nominate an administrator. The administrator can set up your org account, invite everyone in. 
So then everyone, you can get the entire organization's understanding of your digital capability and IT into that tool so that you get better recommendations and you get a more precise uh, report of your stage of capability. So if you go to the next slide, please, now. So the guides that we've put together for the BAT, um, you know, if you're planning to use the digital assessment tool, um, the link, the first link is where you can get access to the tool. The tool is a free tool. So if you click through there, you can just go build an account. Um, we have a guide in here. The second line is a guide that helps you set up your org account. So if you were struggling with that, there's a guide to help you set up your org account. And like I mentioned, the data is meant to be collaborative. So if you go to the next slide, um, Val. Uh, I've actually already covered this, so I'm just going to move through um, to this. So a little bit, a little bit about how we've picked these five stages of capability. So the way that we've looked at the stages of capability and of digital transformation is, you know, digital transformation. I started this whole uh, conversation um, around digital transformation. Digital transformation is not about technology. Right, that's what we always say. But in reality, digital transformation, what does transformation even mean? <laughs> is around the, how the org adopts technology, processes, and helps people and their culture improve so that digital tools can be adopted to have greater impact. So when we developed this digital capability model, we thought a lot about what aspect of people, process, and technology are we really measuring? And we, you know, kind of we decided that for technology, it's not only about what technology you're getting. What we want to look at is your approach to technology, is your state of technology, and are the data systems that you use. For processes, we are looking at your org processes. So does your org have individuals that do different processes, which is ad hoc? Um, are your processes informal? Like, you know, you probably have one process for taxes, but don't really know where the other processes are. Um, is it documented? So standardized, have you documented every, every process? But then, you know, what we find with standardized orgs are they don't go back and review the processes or update it. So the, you know, do you, do you update it? Do you optimize your processes? You know, have you made it more comprehensive? And then adaptive is, do you often go in and do it iteratively? So for processes, we look at the org process uh, systems. For people, we look at the skills as well as the technology culture. So it's a fairly complex, the logic that we built on the back end of the tool is fairly complex. The way that we have written all of the questions in these six focus areas are taken into consideration all aspects of people, process, and technology. Because you know, what we wanted to provide you were with recommendations that matched where you are with respect to your people, process, and technology so that it's easier for you um, to adopt them and to move to the next step. Um, so next slide. All right. So. If you wanted to do digital transformation planning, how do you get started? Make a plan. That's the worksheets that I shared in the first half. Pick your team and your leader. Figure out who is who's gonna be the person that's gonna lead this and take everyone through these worksheets and these guides. This person you pick should get an account on the digital assessment tool and we've shared our guides around it. The assessment tool takes you through one introductory assessment. We highly recommend it. In fact, the tool forces you to do it. It takes 20 minutes, but the introductory assessment basically covers all six areas, not in the depth that individual assessments would do, but it's kind of a quick win. It gives you the first overview of your organization and your overall org rating. Um, and then you can complete the assessments for the focus areas based on the areas you picked. Um, the tool automatically gives you recommendations and resources. You can pick the resources you like to go back and fill your plan worksheet. You can also assign resources to specific 
team members. So for example, if you got a resource was a security training and you would be like, yeah, I think Tiffany needs to do the security training. You could go and assign Tiffany and Tiffany would have an email that said, here's a link to a security training that you should, you should do. So the tool is meant to be interactive, it's free. Uh, and I hope that this guide and these steps and the worksheets that we've uh, produced uh, will help you use the tool for your own digital transformation. And I know I'm three minutes over time, but um, is it okay, Val, if we, if we have like two or three minutes for questions? All right, any questions? All right, I don't see any questions. So I think Val, we are ready to go into the solution rooms. Okay, before we do that, let's just do a 20 second look away. Rest our eyes, stretch if you need to. Wiggle your fingers and toes, all that kind of good stuff. Okay. What's going on with my, okay, sorry. <laughs> Welcome to the solution rooms. Um, before we uh, move into the solution rooms and I'm gonna hand it back over to Lily to take you through what that process is gonna look like. If anyone who still hasn't um, changed their name to a number so that there's still a few people where I'm not quite sure where to put you yet, um, so if you can just take a look, uh, I wrote in the chat direct messages to you all. So um, if you can respond, that will be super helpful. Um, and then uh, the only other thing as um, a reminder is, well, as just to let you know that you do have um, facilitators from TechSoup, Kalamuna, and Rooted who will be in the rooms with you. So you'll have some um, sort of quote unquote experts to help um, be there for answering questions, but that for the most part, it's um, more self-facilitated, self <laughs> and Lily will walk you through that in just a second, but um, keep in mind to, to hopefully by the end have one or two solutions to bring back to the group to share out and to pick a spokesperson, and it's okay if it's one of the facilitators, but, um, you know, in case someone else wants to share. So uh, just I'm repeating it again because sometimes, you know, instructions, it's good to hear from multiple voices. So, <laughs> um, but Lily will take you through it now and I'll hand it over to her. All right, I will, uh, I will read this with my quote unquote expertise. <laughs> so um, it'll, we're gonna take five minutes reflecting on everything that we just heard and, and considering these questions. So working from the top to the bottom, can you recall a program's fundraising or communications dilemma where digital enablement would have made a difference? And then what challenges are you facing with digital implementation in this area? Followed by what feels the most pressing at this time? And closing with what feels like it might be the easiest lift for you to accomplish. So if you have a handy dandy notebook or a virtual um, note taking tool of your choice, I'm going to start my timer for five minutes and we can all reflect. All right, so just a quick thing about privacy as we go into the breakout rooms. Um, if you need any of the transcription things, um, you know, it's out here in the main room with me, so it won't be following in other than the um, the things that Zoom provides. Um, we will have a Google Doc 
um, available for people to make a copy of, which we'll get to in just a second. And it will be edit everything's editable open, you know, for now, and then um, won't be editable after the event. And um, anything that is in any of the materials will um, potentially use for um, outputs to the community like toolkits and blog posts, but we won't use any names or anything along those lines. But it's just, you know, to benefit back out. Um, we try and keep all of these kinds of things open source and, and free for all to benefit from. So the goal of the solution room is to have each organization present a challenge that they face in their planning process and then have your group collectively brainstorm ideas, tools, or tactics to, um, to face that challenge. It's great if people can bring their own experiences into this process. The format will go like this. The introductions um, are in the document and um, the instructions rather in the document and we'll share them, but we'll share them briefly. Everyone will start by um, introducing themselves. The groups will have 10 minutes for that. So, um, you know, your name, your pronouns, your accessibility needs, your land acknowledgement and organization, there'll be approximately four to five people per breakout group. Uh, for the roles, it will be self self facilitated. So ideally, there'll be some one timekeeper and one note taker for each group. And then we'll move into the solution room section. Each organization will have 10, 12 minutes, one organization at a time. You'll present your challenge in as much detail as you can and um, under the context of what feels approachable. There are some problems that may not be able to be overcome at this time, acknowledge those. And for those in your group, please acknowledge that as well. After the challenges are described, the rest of the group can ask questions. Please accept the constraints that the person put forward. So for example, if there isn't budget for X, then please accept that in your recommendation. And wanted to share a warm appreciation and shout out to our event planner sponsors and volunteer facilitators uh, who include representatives from Kalamuna, Rooted, Upmetrics, and TechSoup. So this is how um, the breakout groups will go. Again, you'll have um, this is a little, we'll have, you'll have some amount of people with a volunteer facilitator. Um, if you'd like to use the Google Doc, you can um, copy that from the slide deck if you want a place to take collaborative notes. And again, um, those are the reflection questions to consider a problem to bring or challenge to bring to the group. For our um, facilitators in each group, I just pasted into the chat the copy for you so that the um, facilitate, you know, the guest facilitators can make a copy and then maybe just share that link with their group if you want to use it. We found in the past lots of groups just don't end up using them. Um, so it's really up to you what feels um, the easiest and that you'd like to do. Um, but those are in the chat for our guest facilitators. Um, and any, uh, Jessica, sorry to put you on the spot, uh, where would you like to go? <laughs> and then I'm going to open the rooms. <laughs> or if you can put in the chat to me. And then I'll know if you'd like programs, communications, or um, fundraising. Okay, great. Thank you. And here we go. Okay. Any final questions before I open the breakout rooms? I have a question. This is Cheryl. Um, I I went to the Google Drive link that you sent, but I don't see the slide deck in there. So I don't see the link to the Google Doc Lily's talking about. Okay. Um, I can paste the Google here. Um, for now, go into your room and your facilitator will make a copy and then share the link with you. So you don't need to worry about it quite yet. But if you would like your own, um, I'm not sure why it's not showing up, but I'll, I'll figure that out. Here's, here's the link in case anyone else wants to have their own notes. All right. Um, I will also be doing some time checks as we go through so that everyone has some space to take turns and then give you um, sort of the last 10 minutes so that you can um, elevate your one to two things to bring back to the larger group. So 
here we go. Thanks, y'all. Haven't looked away from your screen in a while. Please take a 2020. Do any stretching that you need. We'll do um, a full official break right after our share out. So a break is coming, but please, of course, take care of yourself and take breaks as needed. You know, any sort of bio breaks, no need to wait. But we'll do our share out for a few minutes and then move into our break time. Back to you, Lily. All right. So we are going to share out um, one or two kind of um, nuggets of wisdom or um, interesting elements of your discussion that you had as a smaller group with the larger group so that we can all benefit from the discussions we weren't able to be a part of. And Val, can you remind me how many um, groups we ended up having? Yes, we ended up with four groups. So we have, we can do at least two per group. We have enough time. Okay, great. So group one, can you remember the animal name of group one? Kangaroo. Kangaroo. Um, who would like to share something with the group? Uh, hey everyone, um, my name is Anastasia. And so, um, for our group, we had a, key, a few key um, themes. Um, the first one being, we discussed um, how do you streamline and manage communication and collaboration um, within an organization that has uh, various departments and goals. And so one of the things that we discussed to you know align everyone and make sure that we're all moving forward cohesively is to kind of understand like what the universe looks like. So collect and gather information, um, create templates that are easy for people to organize and share maybe the products, software, applications that they're using. Um, and then reviews um, and office hours to help people discuss um, and strategize on how we can kind of move forward as an organization together. Um, the other key thing that we discussed was as a nonprofit, there's so many things going on. So just understanding that um, don't get too overwhelmed about thinking about the end goal or the, the final product, but what is the next step and how can you like continue to focus on being progressive and not what um, ultimately you want everything to be perfect or what it looks like. Um, and then never to forget how important onboarding is and onboarding structure and retraining. Um, so when it comes to um, organizations that might be uh, a little bit older that have traditional values or set ways of doing things, when new people come on to kind of share those insights um, and then offer for people that exist within the organization to really um, amp up their learning if they weren't trained when they were onboarded because these tools didn't exist. So that was kind of it for Kangaroo. <laughs> Thank you so much, Anastasia. Um, anyone else from Kangaroo want to layer or add anything? And could we, I see a note in the chat, Val, could we stop the screen share for the share out so we can see our, our share outers a little bit better? Thank you. Um, and I don't have the other animal names offhand, so Val can um, you remind me what group two is, or group two if you know um, who you are. I'd love to hear from you. I think group two is us fundraising folks, yeah? Uh, we were a small group. Uh, there were there were three facilitators, me and Sia and Arturo there, um, and then a couple of orgs, so we got to do a bit of a deep dive into fundraising. Um, and so a few things stood out. Um, Sia was advising reframing how fundraisers, especially we were talking to a couple of orgs that were on the smaller side. Um, so not big, well-developed fundraising departments and which really advising to reframe how you think and talk about a fundraising campaign that it's not begging, but asking people to help achieve a collaborative dream. So the, a, a, re, a personal reframing to make uh, fundraisers more comfortable with, with inviting folks into their mission. Um, and then 
a lot of what we were talking about centered around keeping things simple. Um, uh, and it's sort of building on uh, some of the points it sounds like you all were talking about in the last group about how um, really want to listen to what has worked for an organization in the past. Um, maximizing things that that you know have got some traction to the organization and that preferably that energize you and that that feed feedback the staff um, and that feel consonant with the mission and resonate with your community all of that's really valuable and you don't need to feel like you have to be doing things just because other orgs are doing them other orgs are having success with them and that doesn't mean don't experiment especially if you hear something that feels authentic to how you would interact with your community but it it does mean that when you have success, build on it because fundraising is all experimentation. When you have an experiment that's worth that has worked, it's a good place to dedicate more energy and and keep that simple. Um, and this sort of ties into uh, well, and part of that is knowing and segmenting your audience. So you're speaking to people the way they want to be spoken to, recognizing it's not going to be the same for everyone. Some people want mail. They want something in the mail um, and nothing you do is going to change that. Other people are going to throw your envelopes away. So trying to speak to people where they are. Um, and uh, on the theme of keeping things simple, it's also important to um, value and respect uh, your own time. Uh, so time constraints are real and it's easy to forget that at a nonprofit, everyone is trying to do move mountains, but when somebody has something they want to try, even if it seems simple, um, someone needs to have time to do it. They need to have the organizational, uh, they need to really be imbued with the authority to do it uh, and the support to do it. Um, and so when someone says, hey, let's do this thing, it's, it's really important to be realistic about it and think, who's going to do this? Do, who has time to do this really? Because it's not going to fit in with other stuff unless we as an organization really consciously make space for it and empower them to do this work. Um, and so for everybody on this call to remember that that person is you and you can say, I think this is an amazing idea and I don't have time to do it unless somebody takes something else off my plate. Um, and finally then, when you're looking at various platforms, in this case, we were talking about fundraising, but I think it applies to any kind of platform folks might encounter, really value your, especially if you're the person who's going to be using it, really value your first encounter with it, really value how it speaks back to you, give it 30 minutes. And if, if the demo of this platform, if you're bouncing right off it, listen to that, because um, platforms are really specialized. They have very different strengths nowadays, more so than more so than they have in previous, uh, certainly over the last 10 years. Platforms have gotten easier to use, but narrower and stronger in particular ways, and then often are weak as generalists. And all platforms will tell you they do all things and they don't. So get in there, listen to your experience of it, and, and trust that you really can evaluate these things. And a platform that feels right and works right for you, that, that easier learning curve is hugely important. It often indicates the platform actually works the way you want it to work, and you're not rowing uphill. If you ever, so anyway, uh, trust, trust yourself, trust your sense of how much time you've got, trust what's working, uh, trust your reaction to the software that you've got. And that's up. Sounds like it was a very rich discussion. Um, thank you too. Anyone else have um, anything else they want to, to add? Group two members? That was, I'll add something. That was the first time I had heard that asking people to help achieve a collaborative dream of framing of fundraising. So I just put that in the chat in case anyone else um, wanted to, to note that down. I think group three was, uh, was my group, the Mighty Monkeys, right? Huh? Yes, okay. I think we're gonna hear from Cheryl. Yeah, I didn't remember we were Mighty Monkeys. I just only remembered the monkey oh, I part. Oh, I added that. <laughs> Outstanding. Um, there were several different things talked about. Um, so I would love someone else to weigh in on the other stuff, but the one that um, I'm gonna talk about was um, access check-ins. And um, actually I have a link, let me just put it in the chat now so I don't forget, but I'm mousing with my left hand, so I'm slow. Uh, it's number seven uh, at the link that I just put into the Disability Intersectionality Summit. And number 10 is also super useful to build onto number seven, but access check-ins um, is kind of a reframing 
and centering deaf and disabled people at the center. So typically we have an inclusive space, which is a non-disabled space. And then uh, some deaf and disabled people can be included into it if their needs aren't too extreme or too costly or whatever. And the access check-in paradigm flips that and putting deaf and disabled people at the center. If you have the access and accommodations for deaf and disabled people, I bet everybody, it, it, it's, it's, you're gonna get more people getting their needs met. And the idea is that um, um, everything else stops and you have a check-in about what do you need to participate fully in today's whatever it is. It's not ha that conversation's not happening on the side or in the chat while something else is going on. It is the it is the focal point, and um, uh, there's there, I mean I do trainings on it. There's like kind of a lot of detail. I'm just doing kind of high level um, and not giving all the details about exactly how you do it. But it could be things that are disability related. Um, I need the transcripts. Um, I need everybody to mute because two voices at once makes my head explode, which is true. Um, but it could also be people who are like, I don't know, I'm, I don't have a disability, but I have a backache and I'd really like to walk around during this meeting. And when it's part of the access check-in, then we don't have to see that person as rude or they're not paying attention because they keep walking around. It's this place where you are empowered and you have agency to state what you need if you want, they're never required, but that we all work together to meet one another's access needs. And um, I, I hope that I, I, I went into so much more detail in the meeting and I don't know if I um, did a good job explaining it that time around. Um, did I hit the high points? Does anybody remember? That's my access news. I, some, I need people to remember for me. I think that was beautifully put. The one thing I would layer onto it is um, this was a bit of a piece of a theme that happened in our room, which is around building sort of humanity, I would say, in this um, in human connection in this digital space. And um, what I really resonated about what Cheryl shared in our in our small group beyond what she shared with you is that it provides this chance for us to say, oh, I have a need as a human. And so then it's like, well, then we're acknowledged as as people and sort of it builds that great foundation for that connection. Yeah, thank you for adding that. Yeah, because the way we typically do it is we have the regular or normal quote unquote, you know, regular way we do things. And then if you have a quote unquote special need, you can ask for it and maybe we can meet it. And we just reject special. I just, I'm a disabled person. I reject the word special. I reject the framing of things special. It's not extra, it's just specific. And if you see a, this specific disability related need as just part of what we're doing, we try to meet what we can, then it does humanize disabled people who are often so dehumanized by simply asking uh, to have access needs met. But when we acknowledge that every single person on this Zoom call right now has access needs, um, I think probably everybody has the lights on so that you can see the computer. You've got internet access so that you can be on the Zoom call. And maybe somebody else also needs the transcript. Great, that's just one more access need. It's, it's a real reframing of it. And when I've done these in person pre-pandemic, there's often someone who cries and says, nobody, literally no one has ever asked me what I need to participate in a meeting. Wow, we've been here 10, 15, 20 years and nobody ever asks, what do you need to be here? So um, anyway, there's so much more to say about how to do an access check-in, but that was, the basic thing and I have a lot of appreciation for my group member group or my mighty monkey members who appreciated the idea of the access check-in so thank you that's beautiful and our group and beautifully shared with the broader group um, any other magnificent monkeys want to share something from our discussion with with the broader um, group sure I think you know I think a lot of the themes that I overarching things that I picked up was basically about empathy and understanding. Uh, I mean, I think that Kathy um, McGuire had an issue about trying to, you know, first they had a, a small organization that didn't have a lot of resources, but they also needed to kind of get an assessment of what their organization's like needs were. Um, and I think, you know, what the, the recommendation was really kind of finding a, a consultant that would really be able to listen and understand and empathize 
to be able to identify what the needs are and then maybe then put together sets of solutions. So, so I think that and also Daniel's question uh, um, as well. Um, I think everyone's, you know, kind of like questions and issues and solutions are really around, I think, listening and understanding. So that seemed like a common, common uh, uh, kind of theme. Definitely. Um, I think we, you said four groups, right, Val? So um, group four, I guess the, it's either the last group that hasn't shared. What would you like to share with the community? I guess that's us. <laughs> I don't know that we had a name. I, I don't think we did. Um, we had a good discussion, and I think our main points that we came up with are that your organization, no matter what your goals are, you need to figure out, this is communication-wise, what your goals actually are, you know, and if you need to write them down, literally write them down, um, that's what you need to do. And then from there, you need to figure out what are the best ways to achieve these goals. And um, but like, it, it's just a, it sounds so straightforward, but it's, it's not. And um, we've, we had such a diverse group of people in our little, little breakout group that it was interesting to hear what different people had to say about just those two goals. So I don't know, does anybody else in the group want to add anything? Um, I'll just add that we, we talked a lot about understanding audiences and, sh and strategy around that, because a lot of times with capacity limited, we try to do too much or we think we have to do too much and we get overwhelmed. And so to really kind of take a step back, as Gretchen was saying, provide some strategy and then kind of be more, um, really try to understand, it goes to the whole idea of, you know, kind of adding some human value into it and putting some personification into it of who you're trying to reach, who you're targeting, how those people uh, want to be uh, engaged with. And so I think that sometimes defining that a little bit more beyond our, the structure of what we think we know is important. Uh, I'd like to add a bit to uh, this is Mona. Uh, we also talk about uh, uh, using some tools that can help us. A lot of us are struggling to uh, understand our audience and have uh, deeper dialogues with them. So we talked we talked about maybe using surveys, like really quick one or two question survey on on certain pages. So uh, uh, um, Andrew gave some good examples of quick survey questions you can uh, ask on uh, in your web on your website, like Google Forms, Hotjar. Uh, form stack. He can provide all that. Another one is also to leverage partnerships, um, finding businesses that are also wanting to promote their branding or promote their messaging, and they might want to connect with you. Your 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 mission and values may very well align. So find those businesses and 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 have them promote you. Uh, uh, and that way you can reach a very wide, uh, reach wider, diverse audience. Uh, um, yeah, so, so so these are some strategies we came up with, and also analytics on your website is really important. So uh, understanding who is coming, when are they coming, uh, what uh, pages are they clicking through. Uh, so there are different tools that can help you uh, analyze uh, how people are using your website and what they are interested in. Thank you so much, Mona. It seems like a very rich discussion in every single group. Um, so. Glad that um, hope that was really valuable for everyone. I think um, I don't know if you want to screen share the the deck file, but we're just moving into a break for right now. So um, are we still doing fifteen minutes, Val? Yes. Sorry. Yes. Sorry. <laughs> I need so, to turn back on. So, my mic. Um, let's just um, let's come back at um, we'll do fourteen minutes just so because it's cleaner. We'll come back at. Um, I can do math in my head. Four minutes after the hour, is that right? So, um, yeah. yes. Okay. So we'll come back at four minutes after the hour, and I will come on here at the hour to just tell everyone, hey, we have four minutes left. So feel free to leave your screens. You'll hear my voice when it's time to start coming back. 
Um, okay, so now it's time for us to move into our technology topic deep dive breakout groups. Um, these are all of the topics that are available to you. Um, you should be able to see the breakout rooms and be able to self-select um, once I press the open all rooms and you can come and go into whichever rooms you would like. Um, feel free to come back to the larger space and ask any questions. Um, here in the larger space, um, will be I will be hosting the virtual workplaces and connections. Um, so even though you'll see um, a, a, a group eight open up, um, it says none next to it because you're supposed to stay here with me. Okay, but the rest of the topics, um, one, all things data related um, will be hosted by um, Stephen from Upmetrics. Um, automation from and will be with Andrew, um, marketing automation with Andrew in um, with Rooted in group two. Um, three will be anything nonprofit industry with Mona from TechSoup. Website CMSs and integrations will be Lily and Anna from Kalamuna. Um, pros and cons of all CRMs will be Daniel from Giant Rabbit. Knowledge project and file management will be Marcus from Rooted. Building and cultivating your donor base um, will be Sia from Rooted. And um, as I said, virtual workplaces and connection will be me here in, in this space. Um, so please let me know. We'll just take a minute. And if anyone has any questions before I open up all of the rooms. I see one in the chat, Val. Um, oh, okay. we, have, we have an ATA, my joke for all the acronyms, um, and yes. a request to define CMS and CRM. Yes. Okay. So CMSs are your content management systems. Those are usually the things you use to build your website like WordPress or Drupal, or let's say use Wix or Squarespace, pretty much anything website related um, will be in that room four. Um, and then CRMs are um, uh, client relations management, community relations management. I never know what the C is for, but it's essentially like all of the ways that you track the people um, in your community and how you sort of figure out how you're communicating with them, what you're remembering about them, and if those things are centralized or not. And there's lots of different systems that integrate with your website or that even act as website platforms all on their own. Um, and so that's everything sort of related to like how you manage your donors versus, you know, the with SIA is more about building and cultivating. So more around relationships versus the technology itself. Daniel, do you want to add anything to that? No, that was really well put. Okay. Sometimes I don't, you know, it's not my area of expertise. So, <laughs> um, okay. Any other questions in here? Let's see. Uh, Elevating a question, expand on what nonprofit industry is about. So there was a question in the, or there was a couple things posed in the Jamboard that felt sort of like general nonprofit industry. So strategic outlook of the nonprofit industry, using data to inform program priorities and show impact. Um, and there was one other one that was not necessarily purely data, but it it felt kind of more about talking about the nonprofit industry in general. So I don't know if that was anyone here that that put that there. So it could also just be anything you know related to what Mona presented around like digital transformation in the nonprofit industry. So um, I would say it's it's sort of any of those above things, your general sort of issues being a nonprofit in technology that's less specific than some of these other things. And um, covered in all things data, um, to some degree that's up to you. Maybe I'll uh, <laughs> let our facilitator chime in, but um, some of the things quickly that were put into the Jamboard um, were things along the lines of determining areas for data democratization without affecting data hygiene, ongoing impact of algorithms, 
um, and sort of how that has um, direct effect on progressive work. So some things were conceptual, some things were more tactical. Um, let me see if there's anything else written here before I hand it over to you to give any more input. Uh, I'll stop there. Top of the afternoon, folks. Um, yeah, so to that point, um, the things you you shared as well, I I'll, I'll dive into, but um, big part of the conversation is going to be qualitative and quantitative data, right, is the idea that there's all kinds of information that can inform your work. Um, also, hopefully, a conversation about using data to improve your work, not prove your work. Um, I think that's kind of where some of the facilitation conversation will, will stem, and we'll see where they take it. But that's some of the, the high-level stuff that I was asked to do by Lisa, my colleague. Thank you. Of course. Um, okay, the next one, can you explain knowledge project and file management? So thinking internally to your organization, how do you, um, how do you sort of organize your, your different things? Do you use spreadsheets to share things across for project management or, or file management? Um, do you use Google Docs? Um, do you use Google Drive in general? Do you have other ways? Do you have file naming conventions that you use? How do you sort of share knowledge across your organization? Um, and how do you keep those things organized? Do you use any project management softwares like Asana or um, I mean, there's so many out there. Click, is it click up is a newer one that people have been using. I don't know. There's so many out there. We tend to use Asana or Basecamp. So um, it'll just be all of those kinds of things um, to discuss with one another and sort of see what people are feeling challenged by. I think some of the things that people had written in the Jamboard were project management software that's best for small but growing teams, um, knowledge management, where to find. Um, information around like HR and trainings and things along those lines. Um, and then how do you document the knowledge that comes into your organization so it can be shared, um, you know, because there's always issues with succession and turnover and all that stuff. Um, and then questions around some operations dashboards was what else people had written here. Just as a bit more context, these breakout, um, these deep dives are really by and for you. So if you're unfamiliar with the Jamboard Val is referencing, we asked you, what types of things would you like to discuss or something like that? So that's how, what framed these discussions, but we'll, we'll continue to hone them as the questions and, um, and the discussion that comes in that room. So Thank not you. quite as prescriptive, yes. Yeah, yeah, this is much more open than, than not. <laughs> Okay, anything, anything else I missed? And you'll be able to choose your own adventure in just a second as soon as I open it up. But I wanna make sure everyone has questions answered out here. And you can always, again, come back and ask questions if you're um, stuck or don't know where you might wanna go next. So fe also feel free to move in and out. I want to set that precedence now that I know we're in a virtual space. And so if we were in a lot, you know, together in real life, you might get up from the table and move. So let's just set that precedence so that nobody has their feelings hurt or feels awkward. Like that's totally okay to do, <laughs> to just move to the next room if you feel like, oh, this wasn't quite what I was hoping to talk about and you want to move, you know, somewhere else. So let's just all sort of share kindness with one another and, you know, assume best intent. Okay, ready everyone? Here we go. We're doing so good on time, can I just say? All right, <laughs> like right on time, it makes me happy. Here we go. So you should have a prompt and then you should be able to choose where you wanna go. All right, so just like we had before, we'll have a share out to the group from each of the breakout rooms since unfortunately we can't be in more than one place at the same time so that we can benefit from the discussions that we were not able to be a part of. So with that kind of verbose introduction, um, group one, all things data, who would like to share some of your insights? I was going to be quiet because I facilitated. So if anybody wants to jump out, please do. There was some great combos. No problem. I'm happy to fill in. Um, Steven to the beta group. Nice to see y'all. 
Um, what I thought was really interesting was the, the, the diversity of the room, right? You had development officers, you had executive directors, you had communication officers, and a, a lot of the conversation on the front end was about the lens by which we look at information. If your role is communications versus operations versus executive, that's going to change what you're looking at and how you're looking at it. And we talked a lot about qualitative and quantitative information and how they can be used to kind of pull together that fist of impact. Um, but um, very, very spirited group. I thought their conversation was great. And I don't know if I missed anything, but um, very, very pointed uh, focus they're having. Anything else? Yeah, well, I guess maybe we should keep going because there's a lot of rooms. Um, room two, automation. All right, well, I'll step up, I guess. Um, we talked about a bunch of things, but I think one of the things that we uh, landed on talking about for a little bit was this idea of wanting to send out email digests um, automatically off of the website. And are there ways in which, you know, after at a certain period of time that our email systems can send out like an automated email about all of the content that was been, that's been posted on the site and I was most familiar with um, MailChimp doing this through what's called an RSS feed, um, but I don't know if there are other platforms that do it. Uh, there might be other ones, but we thought that that was uh, kind of an interesting thing to dig in on a little bit more. And I think the other thing that we talked about was how to um, generate good email content um, not not the content itself, but the code behind it, because uh, some of the some of us felt more comfortable working within code uh, and then dumping that into our email platform versus uh, using a drag and drop interface. Um, I think that was it. Oh, and then I wanted to add, we also talked about just this kind of state right now of like um, testing. So like mm -hmm. if you want to test the website, and things like that for changes, also accessibility. Um, and I think right now the consensus was that a lot of the test testing tools are really still very technical in nature. So there are still uh, not really anything that are just like no code based or things that would be more user friendly for non technical users. Yeah, thanks, Doc. Um, room three, more a broad nonprofit industry discussion. Um, I can I can give an overview. We had a great discussion. Uh, actually, Anastasia and Pauline uh, were in our uh, room, and uh, we had a broad discussion around how to set up, uh, develop. Uh, a dev pipeline for an organization that has been there for a while, but now is refreshing uh, where they are looking for funding and how to mm -hmm. think about messaging, uh, target audiences, what are the various things you have to think about as you are kind of almost starting a dev pipeline from fresh, right? The, the technology, the relationships, the types of fundraising, the messaging, the CRM, the website. So we had a really great discussion about the kind of challenges also about, um, you know, what are the ta right target audiences given that COVID has been so devastating? You know, like how has that changed uh, the kind of uh, dev um, uh, industry and where we can actually get dev from? How we spoke a little bit about how philanthropy is changing. Um, and what are the focus areas that philanthropy has right now? Uh, and then, uh, we also spend a lot of time talking about IT and how, um, you know, how to become tech agnostic as a sector where, um, you know, a lot of uh, nonprofits start with tech. So we get dependent on the technology um, and we had discussions around how to start with the process and what your org needs first so that you can always shift because technology changes so often. So we had discussions around how many or apps that are available for the same thing and what's, what's the right app to use for what you want. And then how do you even go to the next app because what you want might change. So uh, we had some discussions around spending time and understanding your own processes. And then um, you know discussions around speaking with IT and when IT 
uh, designs or goes to a new tech to start thinking about moving to another tech, right? So when in your tech planning and implementation, assume in that implementation that you will have to migrate. So create systems, create processes that help you and your organization migrate. So um, it was just a fabulous discussion. I want to thank Anastasia and um, Pauline, um, you know, for giving giving us so many wonderful topics to uh, talk about and think about. Well, I'm glad you had such a good time. Um, I'll go fast since I know we don't have a ton of time left. I was in um, Hub to Facilitate Room 4. We were talking about choice. So sort of like, we need a website and we don't have one. Should we look at Squarespace or WordPress? We're in Drupal 7. Should we look at Backdrop or Drupal 9? And so it was a lot of those kind of choice points. And then we talked about some of the advantages and disadvantages, like a lower cost of entry or more robust functionality for things like, like um, personalization. So really rich discussion in group four as well. How about you, group five, pros and cons of CRMs? Uh, I'll, I'll cover that. We, uh, I was supposed to be able to speak to the pros and cons of all CRMs. I haven't actually used all CRMs, uh, but I can say that all of them are bad, um, but some of them are good at some things. So, um, if, uh, so really, we we're talking about how um, you, the user, or your team, the user team, your experience and which platforms you've used, you're comfortable with, and you like is incredibly valuable. It's easy to undervalue that as your organization is thinking about what platform to use. Somebody who knows how to use something, that's very, very important. Um, now, that's not to say never migrate. It's not to say never make a change. But if you're going to go to the expense and difficulty of migrating or changing, make sure you're solving a specific need. Um, data migrations are, are long. They can be traumatic. The bigger they are, the more difficult they are. Um, and if you're going to your first one, in many ways, that's easier because you're adding tools. If you're transitioning from one to another, now you're taking tools away. And it's really important to take that seriously. And that usually means doing it incrementally. It also means doing it only for a really good reason. Um, and whenever possible, manage these kinds of tra transitions this step at a time. Um, if somebody tells you that a CRM transition is going to be easy, you can just stop listening to them. They're either wrong or they're lying. Um, but silos between your data is are, are okay um, sometimes, as long as you're thoughtful about them. So it, it is... Um, when you're switching to a new system, look at transitioning certain parts of your workflow, certain processes, um, and going with things that platforms do really well. And then being really thoughtful about how you either move data back and forth manually or in an automated way. And eventually, when you do make a full transition over, you know exactly why you're doing it. You know what matters to you. You're an expert in both platforms. Let this stuff take time. Let the complexity reveal itself in its fullness and value your own expertise as you go through it. Nice, thank you. Um, I'm just not acknowledging the time. We may go a few minutes over, but we're going to let every other group um, share. So just know that if you have to drop off on the hour, um, you're welcome to do so. But let's talk to group six, knowledge, project, and file management. File management. Hi, everybody. Yes, we did. Um, knowledge, project, and file management are three specific things that really you got to take each individual one as it comes. And so we started, we kind of dove into file management first because we thought that's where the issue was, right? Um, not knowing how to share documents, not knowing how to properly inform people um, about what's going on within the agency. And these things can hinder communications a lot of times. But when we took a, a, a step back and looked at it as a group, Cindy, uh, Savannah, and I realized that maybe it's actually more about knowledge management. And so how are we uh, documenting process? How are we uh, defining roles? How are we communicating uh, with each other? Because what happens a lot of times is that individuals will come and go within the agency structures um, and organizations and that information isn't passed on. Uh, people don't know where things will be at different points in time. And so to really take a step back sometimes and strategically think about what are we doing? How does this work? Um, how can we improve it? How do, how, where are we keeping things? And then the, doing trainings uh, and sharing that information with team members and having a process for that as well is an important part of uh, overall project management and file management. And then to also create systems that are in place and define those systems that give people access in ways that uh, doesn't overwhelm them but also shares with them uh, the information that they need and allows them to provide feedback. 
And so those are some of the things that we generally spoke about in a very broad terminologies. <laughs> so uh, thank you to Cindy and Savannah again for participating. Fun. Some, of the, oh, some of the tools, I, I forgot to say this, some of the tools that we discussed were uh, specifically Asana, but then for those who might have tech difficulties, um, really accessing and, and training around some of these tools, like, um, because they're not all going to be online. It's also just thinking about it sometimes in an analog sense of, you know, where file cabinets are and things like that, and, and, and understanding the process of who has access to those things. So um, Google is a great tool, um, database servers. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, I saw a note that, um, that we were clustered away from room seven. Um, some of the other topics were, I guess, of, of higher uh, focus. So let's move to group XX or eight, <laughs> the virtual workspaces and connection. Nobody was in our group. <laughs> we all feel connected and virtual these days. That's good. So that's, um, I think that's the end of the deep dive, the deep dive breakout uh, report back. Share it. All right, thank you. Let me, oh, where, Lana, I lost my screen here. One second, sorry. Um, um so oh sorry i just realized this still says nothing <laughs> can you hear me yes okay um so just really quickly, for those who want to stay on for the last piece here, um, we have some time for networking and some resources. Um, and uh, we also have a survey that I put into the chat. So please take our survey before you head out. And all of those who are staying on, then now I will hand it back to Lily. Are you going to share your screen? I'm not seeing it. Oh. Sorry. Okay, sorry, sorry. All good. All good. There we go. <laughs> so we have some, um, some opportunities for you. The first is to make an announcement to this community. So if there's anything your organization wants to share with us, please share that in the chat. And as a quick closing activity, we'd love to hear in the chat one thing that you want to commit to do in relation to technology in your organization. So Please chat with us if you would like. Could be that you are forming your thoughts, take your time. Could be that you are forming your thoughts in your in your brain and they're not formulated enough to go in the chat. Either way, I'll give you a minute to think about it. Starting to see some come through. Get one lo location for all of our data to be viewed. Commit to taking the time to make things more explicit about what our tech needs and expectations are and what resources we have to meet those needs and expectations. Some thanks. Thank you all. We'll extend that thanks back to you. Thank you all for coming. We really hope this was valuable for you. I think we're ready for the next piece. So this is just a quickie here. Um, as I put in the chat a few times, if you have any resources that you'd like to share that came up in your discussions, um, please paste them in the chat and then I'll put them into here into the slide deck. 
Um, there's the full resource folder that has a bunch of stuff from today as well, um, as well as some tips that already came across. And I also just pasted, um, Rooted has a community Slack um, area if anyone wants to join and continue conversations with each other. Um, you would just, I just created a new nonprofit tech summit channel. And then there's also just a vent channel, which sometimes we all need a place to just like vent about things. And so um, <laughs> there's also some other channels in there. You can look for things around just general stuff or around values. If you're trying to work on values, other communications kinds of things. Um, and the community, um, you know, we post things in there every now and then, but it's really meant to be a place if anyone wants to ask questions and, and share out um, and be able to continue this work together. Um, so yeah, if you have any other things you want to, me to share and put into the resource slide, I'm happy to do so. And our last thing here is just some time for those who want to stick around um, and have just open chatting time. We can all just stay in this room for those who want to stick around. I also um, will open up some rooms if you, you know, are wanting to private chat someone, then you can move into one of the breakout rooms together. So I'll open those also. Um, and yeah, we'll just kind of hang around until 1.30 in case anyone has anything else they'd like to talk about. And thank you all for those. Um, if this is your first event with us, thank you for coming. Um, yeah, it was, it was a lovely time with you all. So thank you for taking the time out of your day. Thank you. Thank you for all the costume contest participants. You exceeded my expectations. Thanks, Sydney. Thanks, Scott. Thanks, Talk. For those who do want to stick around, what do we want to talk about? <laughs> Thanks, Paul. Thanks, Savannah. It's good to see you. Oh. Hey, Kathy. Hey. So I, I was working on the Survey Monkey thing. I um, I have a very specific question, so I don't yeah. know, but um, we work with the power of art um, related to people's visions on how to create. Uh, safe neighborhoods um, to reduce gun violence. And um, it's hard to think about how to measure that, you know, as well as social emotional growth in young people. We also work with incarcerated youth, so we protect their identities. Um, and often we can't use technology with them. Mm -hmm. So Anyhow, it's a whole basket full of data questions <laughs> related to our specific organization. But um, yeah, I mean, I don't know how you show, you show social emotional growth in, in the short term. Um, so that, I guess that's my overall question. Hmm. Hi, Kathy. Um, I'm Sia, it was rooted. Okay. One question I have and because I remember working with an SEO program and it is so hard to be able to explain to like supporters, funders, you know, how do you demonstrate kind of the same question that you're asking. I think about practical things as far as um, what are some small wins when you think about uh, behavioral changes or changes in processing or coping skills, if you will. Are there different ways that the youth that you're working with are able to interpret and kind of de-escalate themselves. Things that you can point to that show the impact of your programming are sometimes the things that you can say short term, well, we gave them a strategy to deal with anger, or we gave them a system um, to be able to express when they need a timeout or a break, thereby de-escalating conflict or something to that effect. I don't know if that's helpful or not. Yeah, that is helpful. Thank you.
Yeah, I think along those same lines, um, the first question I would say is who are you trying to communicate it to and try and figure out what it is that's important to them to know. And I, I mostly funders, mostly funders. Okay, yeah, which is not surprising. And I think Sia hits on a bunch of good things there. And one of the, from a quote unquote data perspective, that it sounds like you were kind of hitting on this a little bit in your original question. I think one of the best ways to show that to funders oftentimes is in like quant qualitative types of data. So case studies, you know, interviews, things like that. Um, obviously with youth, you have to protect their identity. So you probably can't use a specific name, but I do think if you can, um, even ask a question like, uh, when they begin a program, ask them, you know, how they feel like they, uh, address certain situations and then ask them afterwards if they feel like they've improved their capability to address those situations. So that kind of information, I think from a pure data perspective, can be one way to sort of tell that story or frame a narrative around that, that when, you know, ex youth come into our program and this is kind of what they generally tell us, or this is a specific example of what somebody told us, and this is what happens after they complete the program. Um, I've I've seen that in a few different um, data courses that I taught with TechSoup and with Upmetrics where Steven worked. There were a few organizations that had that same challenge um, to say, look, like we're dealing with really systemic level things. How do we talk about how our work impacts that? And I think one of the big ways that we had um, resolved that was, was through this technique where you kind of ask somebody something at the beginning and ask them at the end and it's that change that can kind of tell the story of what your program does. You're saying ask them the same question or ask them how they changed? Ask them how they changed. I would say at the outset, so I can't remember, you know, I think one of the examples was, you know, talking about how people feel in their day-to-day -day experiences, you know, um, and then at the end, and that would be at the beginning or the outset of engaging in the program. You know, when you go to school, do you feel anxiety around bullying or something like that? And if people talk about that, then at the end of it, say, do you feel like you have any additional tools or coping mechanisms to be able to handle bullying? And then people can essentially answer that. So, based on the goals of the program itself, you can kind of set up the questions at the beginning of the experience versus at the end of the experience and use that, the, that data or just like a case study to show what the impact of the organization has had. Great, thank you. Yeah. And then actually one other thing to add on to that, one of the other ways that you can then go to the funders and say, hey, this, this same, uh, challenge exists at a much more global level as you can then expand it out and get some sort of data set from like let's say a city or a municipality or a state or even a country and say hey there's another 30,000 people that face that report these same issues right and so this is the impact that we've had but it's at a much larger scale you know and we hope to address that in xyz ways mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Marcus, do you have anything to add? You know our work. <laughs> um, I was going to, I mean, Andrew hit it right on the head. Yeah. So I think it's a lot of it has to do with creating narrative around the data um, and, and using the data to support that, especially with the work that you're doing, because so much of it is around, you know, it's, it's around youth and telling the stories about the impact that you're having um which is which is which isn't always um i know a struggle has been quantifying that like finding the data that quantifiably uh supports that and so a focus on both a, a focus on finding the specific points of quantifiable data that support the qualitative is important because mm -hmm. you're always going to have great qualitative data 
like the stories that the that the youth are going to tell. Um, I worked with Kathy on Oakland Frontline Healers. For those of you, she's she's one of my mentors, and so um, the work that she does is very impactful for young people and for the community. And to I think that there's a there's growth because you work with a lot of the same youth, and so you have the ability to do that. Mm -hmm. Because that's the other big, well, since I'm the only one here asking, <laughs> I might as well pick your brain. Um, so we work with middle school kids, okay, and we develop this amazing uh, curriculum with a school on, um, on gun violence. And, but we haven't done any data when they're juniors, you know, so they're seventh graders, and now they're in 11th grade. And they won't necessarily remember what they did in seventh grade for three months, right? So that's that's part of, I'd love to see that long-term stuff, but how do you measure that? They, they've had five other years or three other, four other years of, you know, great schooling or dysfunctional families or whatever it is. And do, should we expect ourselves to do longitudinal studies when we're a tiny nonprofit? <laughs> do we let that have be someone else? <laughs> like the city of Oakland. It'd be great to find partners who could support that. And I think that there are some in the network who would. Um, I also think that maybe more strategic planning around that in the future um, would be helpful just because to, to Andrew's point, it's like asking the same questions consistently so that you have, so that the data is not all over the place. Um, and really looking at what that looks like. I thought something that came up in one of our discussions was an interesting point um, about the resources around local universities and potentially partnering with them. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if there would be an, a department or a even a program within a local university that would be interested in supporting. <laughs> You're right, like, I mean, those are pretty complex studies. You're talking about following one group of people over a very long period of time and that data is not really gonna be a data set. May not be that usable for a long period of time, um, but maybe there's a, a, a organization within a university or a program within a university that could, would be interested in that or even looking for access to those types of communities uh, for the work that they're doing. So I missed the beginning because I had other commitments. Will you guys, since you're all rooted, will you tell me what you do so I can brag about you to other people and maybe tap into <laughs> you? What, who are you? <laughs> yeah, we're a, a communications agency. We work with nonprofits. Um, and we help them try and figure out who they're talking to, you know, what they're trying to say, and then help them build the tools to do that. So a lot of times that looks like websites or different types of campaigns that they're trying to put on. Um, and we also do quite a bit of branding for organizations. Okay. Yeah, but one and of the big things- are you data driven? <laughs> yes, we are. And one of the big things that is new to Rooted, although you know a lot of the work that we've done has always stemmed from the idea or the, I the idea of being a teaching organization, especially working with nonprofits, we understand that not everybody has the time or resources to, or mostly the resources to be hiring consultants all the time. So we also have um, sort of this education pillar that a lot of these events are built around and SIA is um, running that portion of, the, of our work. Um, so we do a lot of trainings around understand, helping folks identify who are they trying to talk to, what are they trying to say to them, um, how to use data to help them come up with the definitions of their audiences and again the messaging that they're trying to connect with that particular audience so using things like surveys using things like um, stakeholder interviews analytics and things like that great okay well i won't take any more of your wonderful time but i i thank you all i think you had a very successful conference today so thank, thank you. you well thanks for coming too thanks for yeah, thank you
<laughs> Thank Thanks, you, Marcus, Kathy. for bringing me in. Okay, <laughs> blessings. I'll see you soon, hopefully. All right, bye-bye. <laughs> bye, Kathy. Bye. Bye.